Okay, we are studying Pirkei uh, Avot, Perek Bet, Halacha Het. We are up to Rabban Yohanan Ben Zakai. That's what we're up to. We're going to study today. We finished last time the words of Hillel. I, I mean, on this class, we finished almost all the words of Hillel. Then later on in my synagogue on Shabbat, we continue and we finish the rest of uh, what Hillel had to say. So now we are going to study about um, Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai. And just to give a little historical perspective, a couple of things. First of all, Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai was not from the Shalshelet of the Nesim. He was not from the lineage of the um, um, political, uh, rabbinical political leaders of Israel because um, Hillel's son was Rabban Shimon, his son was Rabban Gamliel Hazaken, his son was Rabban Shimon Gamliel, and that Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, who was the great grandson of Hillel, Hazit, um, as I mentioned in one of my previous classes, he was executed or, or killed during the Roman invasion and conquest of, um, of Judea and of Jerusalem, and eventually. The Beit Hamikdash was destroyed as well. Um, so when Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel was killed, he was the Nasi, and his son Rabban Gamliel de Yavne was very young. He couldn't be the Nasi; he couldn't replace his father. He, you know, the Nasi re represents the head of the Sanhedrin, so he couldn't. He, he was not ready for that. So they, what they did is they appointed Rabban Yohanan ben Zakkai. Now, there was also a certain logic to appointing Rabban Yohanan ben Zakkai because he was the one who got Vespasian, the Roman general that conquered Jerusalem, he got Vespasian to establish the city of Yavne as a place for the Hachamim to, re, to, um, to move, to transfer the yeshiva. So the yeshiva, the Sanhedrin, moved from Yerushalayim, it moved to Yavne, and that's because of Rabban Yohanan ben Zakkai. So Rabban Yohanan ben Zakkai was the one who did that. So that's why he was also appointed. Not, I mean, he was. We'll see in a moment that he was a great hacham. But the reason he was appointed the nasi is because he really politically um, was the savior, uh, the one who saved the game in a sense that you know that Jerusalem was destroyed. Nobody knew what to do, and he said, "Let's all go to Yavne." And Vespasian was the one uh, who was convinced by Rabban Yohanan ben Zakkai that the Jewish people, the Hachamim, should be allowed to move to Yavne. Okay, so that's one thing I want to say about Rabban Yohanan Zakai, so you understand why he's put, he's, he's put here, even though he's not the son of Rabban Shimon Gamliel. The second thing I want to say is that the Hachamim teach us that Hillel, the great-grandfather of Rabban Shimon Gamliel, was executed, resulting in Rabban Yohanan Zakai being the Nasi. Hillel had 80 Talmidim. 30 of the Talmidim, the Hachamim say, were re'uyim shetishre alehem shechina kemoshe rabbeinu. That's a very heavy statement. It's almost unbelievable to hear that statement. But they say that 30 of the Talmidim of Hillel were worthy of having the shechina shine down upon them as it's shown down upon Moses. That's an incredible statement. Um, it doesn't mean to say that they were as great as Moshe Rabbeinu, because of course we know, lo kam Israel. Nobody can ever was or can ever be like Moshe Rabbeinu, but that special, there was a special Shekhinah that shone down upon the very, let's say, high level Hachanim. And that was a Shekhinah that reminded us of the presence of God in Oel Mo'ed, reminded us of that. And about Hachanim like that, we say that, that the Shekhinah shall ta'alehem that's that's the meaning of that allegory. It's 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 in the sense that you know we we don't usually see this anymore. When we were in Oyen Mar, we saw this all the time, and suddenly you see a hacham with this splendor upon his face, and um, that special shechinah reminds us of Oyen Mar. So that's thirty of his talmidim. Thirty of the talmidim were at that level, and then the hachamim continue because we said there was eighty talmidim. So if we have thirty. We still have another 50 Talmidim left. So they say another 30 of the Talmidim of um, Hillel were worthy of having the Hamma ta'amod lahem 
he may also have been that the that the that, um, that the Hamas should uh, what do you call it um, stop as it did, did in the days of Joshua because um, in the days of Joshua there was a war uh, the Jewish people were winning the war and Yoshua Binun seeing that soon it will be sunset and the enemy will be able to take advantage of the darkness to escape. So Yoshua Binun made a prayer. He said, Shemesh begiv on dom ve'areach de'aymek ayalon. He made a special tefillah that the sun, the moon, the, the, the moon, the astronomical objects should all stop so that the daylight is extended and so that the Jewish people can finish the job, right? So that's an incredible miracle. And the Tanakh actually says that this never happened before and never happened again, that a man told God what miracle God should do, right? That, that suddenly a man tells God to stop the sun in the middle of the sky. It never happened anything like that before. It was always God telling the person, here's what I'm gonna do, and then it happens. So that's 30 of his Talmudim were similar to Yehoshua Binun in that regard. And finally, the remaining 20 Talmidim, they're called Benonim. They were the average uh, Talmidim, right? The average Talmidim. Now, what I'm gonna give you is the explanation that my father gave me. If you look at the Benonim, Gadol Shebechulan Yonatan Ben Uziel. If you look at the, for these 20, 20 Talmidim that were average, the greatest of the 20 Talmidim was Yonatan Ben Uziel. And the youngest, the Katan Shebechulam, the youngest was Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai, who is the author of what we're going to be studying now in the Mishnah. So just to, to tell you, it's really remarkable when you think about the background of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai, you know, who, who, who his colleagues were, who his fellow Talmudim were, you know, 30, Shetishri Alem Shechina, Kemoshe Rabbeinu, 30, Shetamod Lahem Chamak Yoshua Binun. He was in the 20 average, and even in the 20 average, the, the greatest of the 20 average was Yonatan Ben Uziel, that the Chachamim say that when he was studying Torah, and a bird would fly back. There was so much, you know, intellectual energy. It was like fire coming out of his, uh, uh, coming out from him, and it would burn the, um, it would burn the bird in mid-flight. That's Yonatan Ben Uziel. And as we said, Rabban Yochanan Ben Zakai was the youngest. And the Chachamim say, and Iger Shadira Gaon brings this uh, literally. Rav Shadira Gaon and the Iger brings this. He said that Rabban Yochanan Ben Zakai studied the Torah Shabikhtam, Mikra. He studied um, uh, Mishnah. He studied Gemara. He studied Halachot. He studied Agadot, Diktuke Torah, Diktuke Sofrim. So he was, you know, Katan, the youngest of an incredible, unbelievable era of wisdom. So this Rabban Yochanan Zakai was the youngest of this incredible era of wisdom was, you know, makes us all like, uh, you know, like little, you know, teeny, teeny, teeny um, um, intellects. And that's Hillel. That's the testament to the greatness of Hillel. Nevertheless, because Rabban Yochanan Zakai was somehow connected to Hillel, and, and he did what he did to Yavne, so therefore it was fitting that he be the one who continue on the uh, tradition of learning. Um, okay, now let's study, and I'm going to read the Mishnah, I'm going to read the, the words of Rabban Yochanan Zakai. Rabban Yochanan Zakai kibel mehilel umishamai. That's interesting. He wasn't just a student of Hillel. He was also a student of Shammai, and that's important because there was always Bet, Bet Hillel and Bet Shammai. And there was two schools, two Batei Midrash, two Yeshivot, and they did not, not a secret that they didn't always agree about everything. And at times, uh, towards the end of the Second Commonwealth, towards, as we get closer to the destruction of the Bet Hamidrash, things got very acrimonious and out of hand. Um, you know, I, I, I want to say, and you know, maybe you know, maybe I should say this. You know, uh, there, there's a video of some people, you know, in Bnei Brak fighting with each other. You know, little kids. You know, I mean, they're not little kids, but they're fighting and they're punching, and everybody in the yeshiva is, you know, 
And, you know, people say, oh, you know, that happened all the time. Well, that's, that's not really true. No, that didn't happen all the time. That's, that's primitive barbarism. And, you know, there may have been disputes, intellectual disputes between figures like Bet Shammai and Bet and those are intellectual disputes, um, but people weren't throwing chairs at each other or knocking up each other's hats like the anti-Semites used to do in Germany, which is what I saw in the video. And apparently this is common, unfortunately, in B'nai Brak and this particular yeshiva, I, I assume in other places also. Um, it, it, it was almost comical. I mean, it was a primitive form of humanity. When you watch that, you, you, you have no other conclusion but to say this is a primitive form of humanity, human beings that I, and same way when we see mobs in the United States rioting and enter stores and looting, we, we, we have to say this is a primitive form of, of, of humanity. You know, this is not, you know, cultured people who have advanced intellects don't go in and, you know, rob, you know, 35 pairs of Nike sneakers uh, because they just want to do it. Um, right. I mean, if a hungry person will rob food, you know, perhaps that's something we can understand, you know, maybe a person doesn't have clothing for his children, so he'll rob clothing. And again, I'm not advocating in favor of robbing, but it seems we can kind of understand as human beings, but a normal human being doesn't rob, you know, you know, a giant, uh, you know, um, set, you know, 10 sets or 20 sets of Nike sneakers. That's, that's not, um, a cultured form of your, of humanity. Nevertheless, um, I mentioned that there was machlokum between Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel because what was special about the Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai is that he studied from both of them. It says, Kibel mi Hillel mi And in a sense, this was important for the Jewish people because at this time of crisis, the crisis, the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash was brought about less by the Romans and more by the Jewish people. There was so much fighting among the Jewish people because they had different political ideologies and there was disputes about how to deal with the Romans and what to do. So there was so much fighting within the Jewish people that the Romans just let us you know, destroy ourselves. And they were waiting patiently outside the walls of Jerusalem. So we had no choice but to surrender because everybody was starving to death. It's truly a tragic story. The, um, the significance of Rabban Yochanan and Zakai is not just in his achievements. As noted, he established the city of Yavne. As noted, he was a Talmud of uh, Hillel, one of the 80 Talmudim of Hillel. But the significance of Rabban Yochanan and Zakai was that he also studied with Shammai. And therefore, he was a great unifying figure for the Jewish people. They needed somebody like that, who represented the various factions and represented the various ideas. And in one person, we can say he represented everybody. You know, one of the problems in Israel today is that there's tremendous um, hatred and acrimony among the different political factions, so much so that basically, you know, who you vote for is less about who you vote for, and it's more about who you don't vote for, right? Um, so when the Mashiach comes, for example, he's gonna be a figure that unifies all the Jewish people and everybody's gonna be saying, I'm not voting for the Mashiach because I don't like BB or because I don't like Yair Lapid or I don't like Bennett or I don't like him or her. I'm voting for the Mashiach because I actually like him. That's a big chidush, that's something you don't uh, see too much. Um, uh, so, 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 so that's an important that's an important point about Aban Yohanan ben Zakai, and this gives you the picture of who he was. He was one of the greatest leaders of the Jewish people in one of the darkest moments in Jewish history. And at that dark moment in Jewish history, Aban Yohanan ben Zakai was able to pick up the ashes of the destruction, establish the Bet Din, the Yeshiva in Yavne, and continue with the traditions of the Torah and the traditions of learning the Torah. So he really was such an important um, figure. And he says something that was very apropos. He had the following um, adage. If you Torah Torah, If you studied a lot of Torah, right? Don't hold yourself in great esteem for having done so. Because it was precisely for this reason that you were created.
created. I will explain. You know, when a person achieves, naturally, a person feels a sense of accomplishment. And he may even feel a sense of, you know, superiority. I've done something significant. I've done something unusual. And Rabbi Yohamed Zakai is saying, look, if you study Torah, it's not just a question of, oh, well, at the end of the day, I can say I had a great achievement. I had a great accomplishment. I did this. And therefore, I should hold myself in high esteem because this is what you're supposed to do. And one should never hold oneself in high esteem for merely doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? So it's like, um, imagine a person uh, rents a house, he's renting, he's paying the rent, he's a tenant, and there's a landlord, and he pays the rent, and he tells the landlord, look, are you realizing what I just did? And the landlord says, what did you just do? And he said, well, I just paid the rent. And the landlord will be thinking to himself, well, okay, I mean, right, you're supposed to be paying the rent. That's your obligation. I thank you. I appreciate the fact that you're paying the rent, but that's what tenants do. Tenants, they occupy the house and the expectation is that they would pay the rent, you know, and hopefully, you know, make good on their word, right? So it's the same thing with Talmud Torah. The Torah says, One should be occupied with the study of Torah day and night. And even if one is occupied with the study of Torah day and night, all he can say is, at the end of the day, I paid the rent. And that's good. But don't hold yourself up in high esteem for paying the rent or for studying Torah. Say you did, say you did the good thing. That's what you can say, I did the good thing. Um, and, and, and this message was so important because at this time of destruction, you know, with death and, and misery and, you know, economic um, um, deterioration, there was a lot of people who had a lot of good reasons not to study. And I'm sure the people who studied, it wasn't easy to study. It was probably, a, you know, in very difficult conditions. And that's why as a leader of the Jewish people, he was trying to encourage a state of mind that says, studying is not optional. Studying is necessary. It's obligatory. And, and it is, by the way, it's, 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 it's actually one of the misvot of, uh, one of the misvot ased de oraita is actually to study Torah. It's a misvat ased de oraita. So the same way you put on tefillin every single day, um, the same way you pray every single day, likewise, one has an obligation to study Torah every single day. And that's the great message of Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai. Let's continue. Um, the Mishnah says, Hamisha Talmidim Hayu lo de Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai. Now the Mishnah is describing something about Rabban Yohanan ben Zakai that he had five very well known students. Now this also is important because in Judaism, um, in the Torah system, it's not enough to just study Torah. One who just studies Torah, uh, the Gemara likens that to a person like, um, I'm sorry, uh, like a hadas, you know, we have a Sukkot, a myrtle, a myrtle, beautiful, smelly um, a bush, bush-like uh, growth. So imagine you have a hadas in the desert. Now the hadas in the des in the, is in the desert. There's no one there to smell the beautiful hadas. That's the mashal. The nimshal is a person who studies Torah, but doesn't teach Torah. So a person who studies Torah, it's like that hadas. He, he, he did something wonderful and, and he has a certain beauty to him, but he's not sharing the beauty with anybody around him. And that's tragic. So what Rabbi Nachman Zakai is saying is that it's important and very important to study, but it's equally important to have a legacy of Talmidim because it's only through the legacy of Talmidim that the Torah that you teach can continue onwards. 
So Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai had many Talmidim, of course. Um, he had many Talmidim. Um, right, yeah. yeah but, but uh, no, well, the, and, and, and of course, if we compare him to Hillel, we can say, well, why didn't he have as many Talmidim as Hillel? Because Hillel lived in a time of, you know, greatness for the Jewish people. It was, the Bet HaMidash was around, things were going well. So he was able to cultivate um, all these Talmidim, whereas Rabbi Yochanan Zakai lived at a time of destruction and he was trying to rebuild. But nevertheless, I believe that these five Talmidim probably were his five star Talmidim, let's put it that way, his five star pupils. And it's interesting because what we're going to see is that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai, he detected something special and different in each one of these five Talmidim. Each one of these five Talmidim was special and different. Well, why is that important? Why do I care? So one of the tragedies of the modern educational system, the public school system, the private school system, the yeshiva school system, um, is that it treats everyone like an identical brick. The assumption is that at a particular age, everybody has the same mental development, the same um, linguistic skills, the same mathematical potentials, right? Um, that's a mistake. It's simply not true. People are not bricks. Each person is different. And, you know, our modern school system comes from the British factory. You know, in the British, British factories um, in the industrial age, they started building these factories and the factories had these, um, um, the factories had whistles in them and everything in the factories were, was organized and everybody had a particular spot that they had to be in during the day to do whatever it is they're doing in the factory. And the whistles would blow and it would be time for lunch. And then the whistle would blow again and it would be time to go back to that same spot and do the same thing that they were doing. So human beings are treated like, uh, this is the idea of Abdut. It means we don't recognize the individuality of people and the uniqueness of people. Well, the modern educational system is an outgrowth of the um, industrial revolution. Schools are designed like factories. You have whistles, you have bells, everybody sits in particular spots. And the assumption is that everybody's job is defined to them from the outside. And there's very little consideration of what the student is on the inside and everybody is different. Students are different, people are different. You know, just as an example, and Jordan Peterson writes about this um, in his book, 12 Rules for Life, and I, and I think it's, 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 it's so fundamental. He says that, for example, the proper development of the prefrontal cortex in, uh, in laboratory rice, uh, um, mice, um, sorry, laboratory mice or rats, I'm sorry, it was rats. So he said that, for example, rats have a need to um, jostle with each other and play with each other. And as a result of this playing, the rats develop a certain social skill. And what he points out is that if you don't allow the rats um, to play, you deny him that interaction and that playfulness, um, this, this stunts the development of the prefrontal cortex. And now with Jordan Peterson, who is I, I think one of the uh, great intellects of our uh, age, uh, unfortunately there are not too many intellects in our age, um, um, that's the, you know, intelligence is becoming something very rare. So he's one of the great intellectuals of our age, certainly. And he points out that by confining children in these fixed cubicles called classrooms for so many hours on end, in some cases, and perhaps in many cases, not only it doesn't engender intelligence and it doesn't engender um, intellectual skills, but it may actually stunt it at some level or for some children, right? Everybody is different. And an intelligent educational system, such as the one that will be around in the days of the Mashiach, will take account not about the fact that he's five years old or six years old or seven years old and just stop there, but rather it will take account of the particular child, 
and what his skills are and where he has certain strengths and where he has certain weaknesses. And the education should be um, rather suited for the child rather than trying to suit the child for the educational system, right? Like we have it wrong today, we flipped it, right? We should suit the educational system to meet the child's needs, not have the child's education come to meet the educational system's needs. That's, that's the problem. And what's great about Aban Yochanan ben Zakai is that he identified what made each one of his students unique and different from the other students. And not only did he identify these uniqueness, these unique traits, but he actually uses those unique traits to encourage the student to conduct certain research. And the research is for that particular trait. Use your trait and give me an answer. That's what I love about um, Rabban Yochanan and Zakai. So it's a great lesson for us. And now we're going to study about these five Talmidim. So let's look at these five Talmidim. Hamisha Talmidim, Hayulo le Rabban Yochanan and Zakai. There were five noteworthy students of Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai. The Eluhen. And here they are. The first one. And of course, we're here we're dealing with the uh, generation of the Tanaim, right? right? This is uh, before the Mishnah. Before Rabbeinu Hakadosh by several generations, the Elohim, the B Eliezer ben Horkanus. Whenever you see the B Eliezer in the Mishnayot, Setam the B Eliezer, it's the B Eliezer ben Horkanus. For example, the first Mishnah was Sefer Achot at Sof at Ashmoni Tarishona Divre Rabbi Eliezer. So that the B Eliezer is the B Eliezer ben Horkanus. The second one was Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananya. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananya was also the Setam Rabbi Yehoshua in the Mishnah. So if you look at the second Mishnah in Masechet Berachot, um, Rabbi Yehoshua Omer, at Shalosh Ha'ot. Rabbi Yehoshua Omer, doesn't say Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananya, Rabbi Yehoshua, Setam Rabbi Yehoshua is Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hananya. Next, there is Rabbi Yosei HaKohen. Okay, Rabbi Yosei HaKohen. Setam Rabbi Yosei is not Rabbi Yosei HaKohen. So if you see it just Rabbi Yosei in the Mishnah, that's not him. Okay. The Rabbi Shimon ben Netanel. Rabbi Shimon ben Netanel. Netanel. Again, Setam Rabbi Shimon in the Mishnah is Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai. By the way, many times you see machlokot between Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yehuda. Sometimes Alakha is like Rabbi Shimon. Sometimes Alakha is like Rabbi Yehuda. I know for some reason they turn Rabbi Shimon into some godly figure. I mean, like he's, you know, yeah, like some demagogue, or, you know, he has to be, we have to light, uh, you know, uh, giant fires, barn fires in his honor. I, I'm not sure exactly why a great Hakam who likes to study Torah is going to be honored by people having these big uh, campfires, uh, campfires, uh, and dancing around the campfire. I'm not sure why that should excite the Hakam. I personally, you know, I don't find that to be intellectually stimulating either to, you know, light a fire or to dance around the fire or, you know, to watch people doing it. Again, I'm, I'm just expressing my doubts as to where this um, pagan-like ritual came from, because it is a pagan-like ritual. We know that this was done by the pagan religions extensively, right? Um, there's nothing in the Gemara that would somehow suggest that, you know, the rabbis got excited because somebody lit a fire, a big fire, and they, you know, the whole night they were throwing things into the fire and, you know, the fire got bigger. Um, I, I, you know, again, I have my reservations. I'm, I'm expressing my own personal opinion. I'm sure there's many people who would disagree with what I just said, and, you know, that's fine, but I do need to express my opinion. And so the Bishim on Bar Yochai and the Rabbi Yudah, they always have machlokot. And sometimes Allah like him, sometimes Allah like him. You know, they were great hachamim, of course. I'm not, you know, I'm not in any way trying to diminish, but none of them were gods. That's all I'm saying. They weren't gods. I mean, they weren't like, you know, they don't need to be worshipped. Um, there was a very silly question that somebody asked um, a rabbi, you know, and I don't want to mention the name of the rabbi because it would make, it might make him look um, less than sophisticated because he answered the question. The question was, why did this tragedy happen? You know, we had the tragedy in Meron. It really was a tragic event. It was very 
heartbreaking to see this. You know, there were some American kids apparently who died there because they were in yeshiva in Israel and then they went to Midon, which, you know, I certainly understand. I, I can't, you know, how can I possibly fault that? You know, I, I don't, I in no way fault that. I understand that perfectly. Um, so, the, so many people died, you know, just because they were, you know, wanted to go to Meron. It's an exciting thing to do. Maybe when I was young, I would have gone to Meron and see the campfire and throw things into the fire and, you know, get excited in a pyromaniac way by the uh, lighting of fire. That's just natural. That's youth. Um, but anyway, people died. And, and the question, so somebody asked this rabbi, um, uh, Kvod Haram, um, what's the reason did these people died? Is it be, did they die because is there a kepeda mehakadosh baruch hu, or is there kepeda Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai? Is it that God is angry at the Jewish people, or is it that Rabbi Shimon bar Yochai is angry at the Jewish people? Like which one is it? Uh, I'm, I, I guess that if you believe in Abu Dazara, that's an appropriate question. I mean, the thing is, I would not answer a question like that. I would just tell him. Um, you have to make teshuvah. That question suggests that you believe in Abu Dazara. That question suggests that you believe that Abishu Mariah is some sort of God that has to be placated. I would tell the person that he really has to make teshuvah and say, be doing it on Yom Kippur intensely and make ta'aniyot for his false beliefs. It's Abu Dazara. It's the worst Abu in the Torah. It's Abu Dazara. So I, I would tell him that. But instead, the rabbi answered it and was philosophizing that no, Rashbi would never get angry at the Jewish people. And um, you know, stuff like that. I, you know, again, I, I find this to be all a little um, uh, surprising. And it's a little unfortunate that rabbis, some rabbis obliquely seem to be promoting Abu Dazara rather than saying, hey, stop, this is Abu Dazara, this is not allowed, right? That That's what I would have hoped would be the response, but apparently it's not. Anyway, um, you know, what happened in Meron was really sad. Um, uh, but it happened because of our stupidity. It didn't happen because God is angry or Ashby is angry. It, it happened because we, we, we're, we, we really are at a very, I mean, the people running the event are just, um, you know, not the sharpest crayons in the box. You know, you have a place which is meant for 10,000 people. How can you possibly allow 100,000 people to go into a compound which is meant for 10,000 people and then, and to make matters worse, they have these sealed off areas because they have a um, Hasidic Rebbe, Toldos Iron, Toledot Aharon, who, by the way, hates Medinat Israel, hates Tzahal, hates the Jewish people. I mean, you know, it's, it's just remarkable that a person like that should get his own special lighting of the bonfire in honor of Rashbi. I don't, I don't know if Rashbi would be particularly excited to know that this, you know, um, cult leader is lighting a fire for him. I don't know why Rashbi should be happy, but anyway, to cram in so many people into that small area, I mean, that's just sheer stupidity on the part of the leaders. The people are innocent. I, I, I really believe the people are innocent. Hazat, they get excited. They're there, they think it's religion. They're, they're, they're duped into believing that this is a big misfah and they, they all go and, and, and you know, they're assuming, they're making certain assumptions. If I can go to Madison Square Garden, why can't I go to this? And yeah, that's a, that's a valid assumption because in Madison Square Garden, they actually have somebody there with, you know, an IQ above 17 who looks at the security situation and says, wait, hold on. We're gonna have a lot of people here. Let's figure out how to let the people come in and leave. But this seems to be something that we haven't, you know, at least some, some of us, some of us haven't achieved that intellectual dexterity to figure out that you're not supposed to cram in such a huge amount of people into such a small space. So why did this happen? It wasn't an Arab. It wasn't some foreign country. It wasn't Haman. It wasn't Amalek. It was stupid, incompetent leadership, criminally so. That's why it happened. So it's, it's, it's kind of sad. I mean, I, I have to say that I, I was so saddened to see the reaction, um, you know, people asking how can this happen and why did it happen? Like it's a Holocaust, a Holocaust happened because the Nazis, Amalek came to kill the Jewish people. You know, we, we, there was nothing we can do. But here it's like, we just literally, you know, we just literally caused the negligent death of these poor Hazat, these poor people died for no reason. It's, 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 it saddens me so much because the death was just so, avoidable it was inexcusable i'm sorry i mean i know that this you know many people may not want to hear this but i have to say it it was in 
excusable that these people died. They died because of the sheer incompetence of a phony religious leadership. And it's about time that Am Yisrael returns to the Torah, returns to the Misfot, in my opinion. And by the way, Rabbi Abir Gil, the head of the Bate Din in Jerusalem, just came out this week with an article, and I was very happy to see it, that he considers the lighting of the fire in, in, in Lagla Omer, akin to Abu Dazara. He's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. Anybody knows about fire worship and the Zoroastrian religion and other similar um, uh, religions where fire is an essential element of that religion. It's just, it's, it's, it's idolatry. Be, what they used to do, the original Chalabi custom, and there was other Sephardic communities that did this, on the night of Lagla Omer, they would light some candles in honor of the, the Hachamim, and then they would study Torah. They would study the Zohar, because uh, the, the legend is that the Bishmon Yochai wrote the Zohar, so what better way to remember the Bishmon Yochai than by studying the Zohar? That makes sense. That's, you know, that's a beautiful minhag. They would sing some pismon, they would light candles, then they would sing some pismonim, and they would have like a nice seuda, and then they would study Torah for several hours, you know. Here it's, the whole thing is, you know, where, where's the Torah? Where's the Mispah? Where, where, where is it? Right? So anyway, that's, let's get back to the Mishnah here. We were talking about Rabbi Shimon Yochai because we mentioned Rabbi Shimon ben Netanel, and I wanted to point out that Setam Rabbi Shimon in the Mishnah is Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, not Rabbi Shimon ben Netanel. Let's now go back to um, the fifth Talmud was Rabbi El Azar ben Arach. Rabbi El Azar ben Arach was the fifth Talmud of um, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. Okay, so let's now look at um, uh, what Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai detected that was special in each one of these five Talmidim. Who? Haya Mone Shibhan. The Ban Yochanan ben Zakai used to find, one second. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai used to find what was special in each one of these five Talmidim. And that's beautiful. That's a good teacher. A good teacher is one who understands each one of his students and knows what makes that student special. So he says, first of all, the B Eliezer ben Horkanus bor sud she'eno me'abed tpa. Let's start with the B Eliezer ben Horkanus. The B Eliezer ben Horkanus. Back then, they would have these wells. And in the wells, you would have water, right? You would dig in the ground and you would have a bor and you would have water in the ground. Now, if you wanted the bor to be particularly effective, you would put limestone, you know, on the walls, right? So that the water, the drops of water don't get soaked up by the ground. That's a bor sud. Bor sud means a pit that was, um, covered with limestone, right? They also did this for wine. So if you, for example, if you were, you know, um, wine season, you, you would, you know, step on the wine and then the wine would go from the, that wooden enclosure where you would step on the wine to the, uh, the vat, I guess, I think you call it a vat, I'm not sure. And then the wine would flow into a pit in the ground. So they would also um, put limestone on the walls of the pit so that the wine doesn't get lost. So they said, he was like this, Bor Sud She'eno Me'abed Tipa. He was like one of these pits that every drop of water or every drop of wine is there. It doesn't get lost. Meaning, the Bi'ali Azib ben Horkanus had an incredible memory. And, you know, usually when a person hears a class, he, he remembers a class. He, a person with a good memory remembers a class, remembers a general idea. And, you know, part of a good memory is knowing what to remember, but also knowing what not to remember, right? Because you can't remember everything. So, you know, the mind is always filtering out information. The Bilez Monokanus had an incredible memory. He remembered every single detail of every single class. He never forgot anything. So that's a special gift. That's a special gift. Not everybody has a particular ability. So Rabbi Yohamim Zakai treated the Bilez Monokanus with the assumption that this person remembers every single detail. That's one approach to studying or to teaching. Um, I, I, I remember when the Rabbi Ezebar um in the Gemara describes his death, 
and it says that his Talmud Rabbi Akiva went to visit him, and um, and Rabbi Akiva makes this very powerful statement. Rabbi Akiva was a great um, was the great Rabbi Akiva, right? And he says that the knowledge of the Bi'ele Aizeb ben Horkanus was like a vast ocean. One second. The knowledge of the Bi'ele Aizeb ben Horkanus was like a vast ocean. And I, the Bi'akiva, am like a dog who came by and licked a little water from this vast ocean. That's the Bi'akiva, the great Rabbi Akiva, comparing himself to his teacher, Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkanu. So he must have had a simply incredible, vast knowledge. And this was what made Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkanu powerful. He had this intellectual power that was unique. Let's continue. The next one. The next one was Rabbi Yehoshua. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Hanania. The Mishnah says, Ashre Yolato. Fortunate is she who gave birth to him, meaning fortunate are his parents, or fortunate is his mother. Um, let me explain this at a different at several levels. Okay. What does it mean fortunate is, is his uh, mother? So, first of all, you know, when when um, you, when a child is raised properly. And you see the child, he has a certain beauty, a childlike innocence, right? Until the age of, you know, especially a, a young child at the age of nine, 10, 11, you still have a certain beauty to them, you know, a certain innocence to them and the way they, they view the world in a very pure manner. But then as they grow a little older and, you know, they become a little more sophisticated. And unfortunately, society is very corrupting. Society intentionally corrupts people and wants people to become spiritually decrepit. The Western world today is that. Um, the Western world is about vacating God from our lives. They're trying, they won't succeed, but they're trying to do that. So the point being that as a child grows older, he becomes more corrupt and he loses some of that innocent beauty. Now, when a child has innocent beauty, the parents are so proud to be with that child because he has that beauty and it makes them happy because then whether every, everybody else sees the beauty as they do. So apparently the Biyoshua ben Hananya always had that beauty, had a certain innocence about him, you know, a certain childlike simplicity in the way he related with people, not at the intellectual level, not at all, as we're going to see soon, I'm going to bring to you a story that showed the guy was quite sharp and knew exactly what was happening, but in his midot, in his character traits, he was wholesome and pure. That's one explanation. That's actually my explanation. Um, but there's another explanation. Uh, the Hachamim say, and, and I don't think these explanations contradict each other, but the Hachamim say that um, when his, uh, when Rabbi Yoshua's mom was pregnant with Rabbi Yoshua, she very much wanted her child to be a great Tamil Hacham. And she used to go to the Bet Midrash with the hope that the child would hear the Torah of the Hachamim and that the Torah that the child hears would affect him. And she would pray to God that um, her child be a great Tamil Hacham. She, she used to make these tafilot and people became aware of what she was doing. People were aware that she's going to the Bet Midrash. People were aware that she's praying for one thing from God, that her son be a, a, um, a great Tamil Hacham. And then when, her, when, when the Biyashua ben Hananya grew up, everybody remembered his mom. Everybody said, ah, oh, wow, look at that. You see this? The mom's prayers were answered. The child came out as the mom asked God for the child to be. So that's why the greatness of the Biyashua was attributed to his mom in a nice way, of course. Ashrei Yolato, how happy is she that gave birth, uh, <laughs> that gave birth to him. There's a story. There's a story that when Rabbi Yosho ben Halanya used to walk, all the hachamim used to surround him, asking him questions and uh, discussing the Vet Torah. And once the daughter of the Roman king was walking there and she saw the Rabbi Yosho ben Halanya 
and um, she saw the respect that everybody was was giving him. And she was surprised because he wasn't particularly handsome. Apparently, he wasn't very handsome. Okay, you know, we don't we don't care. You know, we don't know what Moshe Rabbeinu looked like. We don't know what uh, you know. We don't know what Yaakov Binu looked like. We don't know what Shemuel Hanabi looked like because it's not important to us. We don't judge people by the way they look or by the size of their hat. It's not important. So anyway, Rabbi Yishom ben Halem was not particularly impressive in his looks, and she was a little surprised that, you know, the leader of the Jewish people, one of the intellectual leaders of the Jewish people should be, you know, didn't look like um, Charlton Heston. It surprised her. And she saw the respect and the reverence that he had. So she approached Rabbi Yoshua, and uh, she told him, you know, it's a shame that God put so much knowledge in such an ugly vessel. So Rabbi Yoshua ben Hananiah told her, yeah, it is a shame, but I have to tell you, you know, your father is acting like a peasant. Your father, the king, is acting like a peasant. She's like, what are you, what are you talking about? She says, yeah, look. Go to your father's wine cellars and look what he does with the wine. He puts all the wine in these, um, in these clay vessels. Everybody does that. That's the way I store my wine. That's the way my next door neighbor stores his wine. This is the way peasants act. Your father is a king and he's storing his wine in these clay vessels. So the daughter heard this. And she went back and she got to the head of the wine collection of her father. And she said, I want you to store the wine from now on, not in clay, but in silver and gold, silver and gold vessels. And of course, as you probably know, um, wine ferments best in clay. And if you put it in silver and gold, the wine, it gets ruined. In fact, I know people like doing kiddush and silver, uh, wine cups, it's very common. I personally don't because even just putting wine in the silver cup ruins the taste. I don't know why that is. I don't understand chemistry well enough to explain it. I know that when I have the wine in a glass cup, for example, the wine tastes much better than if I was to put it in a silver cup. Nevertheless, she does this. And then a few weeks later, her husband, um, I'm sorry, her father, the king, Want some wine, he tastes the wine, it tastes terrible. She says, what happened with my wine? And they investigate, they call the daughter. The daughter says, Rabbi Yosho bin Hanania made me do it. <laughs> so the, the king calls Rabbi Yosho bin Hanania and says, I know that you're an intelligent person. What happened here? He says, your daughter believes that wisdom would best be put in a beautiful vessel. And she came to me and she told me what she said. And the truth is that the Torah is like wine. And the same way wine gets ruined in beautiful vessels, and it's best preserved and best fermented and allowed to age in clay vessels, so also the Torah. If a person is always obsessed with his looks and you know how beautiful he is, and this, that's not the best way to have the Torah. And the king understood the message well, and he understood the lesson that his daughter learned was so such an important lesson that it was worth losing some wine. But now his daughter understood that the intelligence doesn't need to be reflected in the good looks. So you know, you always have these Hollywood movies where you know you have this actor with you know very handsome and he makes a beautiful statement and the statement seems so much more reasonable because the actor who said it is is so handsome or, or she's so good looking you know and if you have the right music in the background even better but real wisdom is not measured by the physical beauty of the person who's uttered the words or by the nice hollywood music that they have as the words are uttered right but rather it's measured by the actual meaning of the words and the wisdom contained in the words. That's the emphasis. 
And that's what we should look at. So when we look at people, we don't care about the size of their hats or the shrine ball or the peol. I mean, you know, a hakam should be dressed well, of course. But we're not going to judge the hakam based upon how he's dressed, right? He needs to be dressed appropriately because he needs to act in a dignified manner. And the manners of hakam are important to us, of course, right? But the words will be measured based upon what the words are saying, right? So you need to be able to distinguish and separate between the external elements, which is how he looks, you know, and, and this, and, and, and what the words are, right? That's very important. Some people don't know how to make that distinction, especially in the Western world, where we're so obsessed with physical beauty and so obsessed with, you know, the, all these things around that we sometimes lose sight of what's real and what's not, right? All right. Um, let's continue. So that was the B uh, Then, Oh, wow. I see it's 9.30. Okay. So let me wish you all Shabbat Shalom. And I'm looking forward to uh, continuing this uh, next week. All the best. Thank you. Bye, shalom. Thank you. Bye, shalom.